Hello everyone, my name is Courtney Penner. I'm city councilor for Ward 11 and board member at the Calgary Public Library. It is my pleasure to welcome you to this afternoon's program, a tour of Yad Vashem, spiritual resistance within the walls of the museum. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the land, Mukinstis, the lands where the Albo and Bow Rivers meet. In the spirit of truth and reconciliation, we recognize the ancestral territories, cultures, and oral practices of the Blackfoot people, the, the Yetka Stoney Nakoda Nation, the Dene people of the Satina Nation, and the Metis Nation of Alberta Region 3. Calgary Public Library serves the community on this traditional land, and we honor all people who share, celebrate, and steward the Treaty 7 territory of Southern Alberta. We also know that many of you will be joining us from across the province from Treaty 6 and Treaty 8, the ancestral territories of the Cree, the Sotu, the uh, Nakota Sioux, the Dene people, as well as six Métis regions throughout Alberta. This land acknowledgement reminds us of the histories that precede us, highlights our responsibilities going forward, and helps bring us together on a shared journey of truth and reconciliation. Today's program is part of a partnership with the Calgary Jewish Federation, Edmonton Public Library, and the Jewish Federation of Edmonton. Special thanks to Patrick Mealy and St Stephen Dolman from the Calgary Public Library, as well as Marnie Bondar and Dahlia Libin from the Calgary Jewish Federation. This program is supported by the Isidore and Florence Burstyn Memorial Fund, KSW Calgary Holocaust Education and Commemoration Endowment Fund, Viewpoint Foundation, and the donors to the Calgary Public Library Foundation. We invite you to ask questions about today's program using the chat function on your screen. In addition to these questions, we have received questions beforehand. We will attempt to answer as many as time allows. Today's program takes us to Yad Vashem, the World Holocaust Remembrance Center. Established in 1953 by an act of the Israeli parliament, Okunetsit, Yad Vashem is entrusted with the task of commemorating, documenting, researching, and educating about the Holocaust. Yad Vashem encompasses 45 acres on the Mount of Remembrance in Jerusalem and is, and, and is comprised of various museums, research and education centers, monuments, and memorials. Today's tour focuses on spiritual resistance, acts such as the creation of schools, keeping diaries, and maintaining traditions that provide some of the examples of the way that Jewish people fought during the Holocaust. Today, we are joined by tour guide Lori Gerson. After graduating from Barnard College in New York, Lori worked for many years in the field of education in the United States. In 2005, Lori immigrated to Israel, or made Aliyah with her family, and then joined the Yad Vashem team as a guide for education groups. Since 2016, Lori has been the educational coordinator in Yad Vashem's International Training and Education Department, where she lectures, coordinates seminars, develops curriculum, and guides educators in best practices. Please join me in welcoming Lori. Well, thank you very much for that introduction. And um, I thank everybody who was involved in um, having me here today. I feel very honored. Um, so let me first of all, share my screen. So everybody bear with me, um, new technology. 
Um, I have to take care of that. And one second, with my screen shared. Share, there we go. And I'm going to enlarge this. So um, here we are at the entrance to Yad Vashem. So first of all, like they said, as I start every tour, hi, my name is Lori. I'm going to be your guide today at Yad Vashem. So thank you all for being here with me. Um, two things. First of all, I'm really excited to introduce what is really brand new technology. We're going to be taking you inside the museum. Then we're going to be taking you into every gallery, hopefully in the museum. We're going to do a little bit from every gallery. And this is this is brand new. Just it came out in the past few weeks, even before we uh, this came out after we had planned this tour. So I'm really, really excited to be using it. Um, sometimes it does move a little fast. So I hope it doesn't cause anybody any motion sickness. So I'm just giving you a little warning about that. Now, before we go into the museum, I do want to talk about the name of the museum. Why do we call it Yad Vashem? What does that mean? So I'm just going to translate those words. Those are Hebrew words. They actually come um, from the uh, book of Isaiah in the Old Testament, in, in the, from, from the Bible. And what it translates to Yad Vashem means a memorial and a name. And if I could use a little poetic license here, I could also say we could say a memorial to the names. And one of the things that we know, and in fact, I'm going to show you here for those of you who have never been to Jerusalem, you get to see uh, the beautiful city that, surround, that, um, that, that Yad Vashem is a part of. So I'll show you that view as I'm talking for a minute, um, that one of the things we know is that it, nobody can understand or wrap their minds around what it means that 6 million Jews were murdered in the Holocaust. So one of the things that we, we really try to do at Yad Vashem is we try to give back the names and the stories to the victims and to thereby better understand what happened to the Jews in the Holocaust. Okay, so the memorial, we could to the names, and we're certainly going to do that today. Now we're going to walk, this is, you can see uh, how we enter the museum. This is the museum. It's a very interesting structure. We're going to get inside and talk about the design of the building itself once we get in there. This bridge we're about to walk across, I don't know if you can tell from here, it's, we're not going straight across. It does slope downwards. And I want to suggest to you the symbolism there, that as we're walking now into the museum, we're going into a place where man got as low as man could get in his treatment toward fellow human beings. Now, as we enter the museum, it might, uh, the first thing we see in the museum might surprise you a little bit, right? Most people, if they have to guess where the museum would start, we would guess with the rise of Hitler in Germany. I mean, we will see that in a minute. But the first thing we see when we come into the museum, we actually enter into this room that doesn't seem to have a lot in it. It's an open space. We do have before us what looks like a video, sorry about that. See, it's new technology, so <laughs> bear with me. Um, it, it, it's, it's a video, it's actually a montage and I'm gonna play it for you right over here. Um, so you can see it while, um, while I'm giving you a little introduction. I'm trying to enlarge it, I don't know. It is being a little tricky here, like we say. I don't know why, Oops, wait one second. I don't know why that was unavailable to me. Let me try that one more time. And here we go. Okay, um, what we see here, this is called The Living Landscape. It is an art piece done by an artist named Michal Rovner. And we are seeing Jews living in Europe in between the wars in the 1920s and 30s. And that is why we call it The Living Landscape. Now, why did Yad Vashem decide to start with this when we are telling the story of what happened to the Jews in the Holocaust? There's a few reasons. I'm going to go through. Uh, one of them is because very much so Yad Vashem felt that to understand the magnitude of what we lost in the Holocaust, we have to know what we have before. Okay, so we see Jews living in Europe before the war. And also, it's very important that as we go through the museum, like we're going to today, we have to have in mind that unfortunately, after we leave this area, we will only see the Jews as victims. And we have to remember that all the Jews that we're about to learn about, that they came into the world 
as real people with real hobbies and loves and families and jobs and, the, and, and, and all those sorts of things that everybody has in their lives. Now we're seeing your scenes, we, I'm gonna make it a little lower here. We see scenes from Eastern Europe where Jews tended to live in what we call shtetls, pastoral villages. The Jews tended to look very traditionally Jewish. I'm going to jump ahead a little bit here since I have the power to do that. I'm like in the museum, actually. And we're going to jump ahead to some scenes from Western Europe where the Jews tended to live more in the, in the cities. And you'll, see, and you'll see here we have children that, unlike the child we just saw before, they very much blend in with their non-Jewish neighbors. Okay, so lots of different types of Jews that live in Europe before the war. And you see here children playing the symphony. Um, we see, if we jump ahead over here, we're gonna be quiet for a minute. Now, some of you may recognize that song, some of you may not. It is the Hatikva, which is the Israeli national anthem. This video clip comes from Munkach Hungary in 1933. Of course, there wasn't a state of Israel then, right? But it is the Zionist national anthem. And where are these school children standing while they're singing this Zionist anthem? They're outside. They are not afraid to be showing off their Zionist passion. And that's very important because one of the messages in this area is that not only do we see what we lost and do we see that they were human beings, but if we go back, we also get a sense of the, um, the lives that the Jews live there and it's a life that they are used to, right? They're very comfortable. And in fact, there's a hint to that in this room. I'm gonna turn around over here, we're about to leave this area. And if I go very close, if I, I don't know if you can tell, but what we're standing on, this area of the museum is we're standing on carpet. And we think about it, I always ask guests who come and they visit Yad Vashem, I say, what kind of feeling do we get from carpet? And, he, and everybody always answers me, we get a very warm feeling, a very comfortable feeling, a very homey feeling. And I think that's the message that Yad Vashem wants visitors to understand is they're watching these video clips and these pictures and this montage called the living landscape of Jews living in Europe, the 1920s and 30s, that the Jews during this time are very much at home. It's a world that they're familiar with. It's a world that they know. Okay, now what happens is, and we continue to slope downwards. Remember, we talked about the symbolism there. That as we start and we enter the museum itself, notice that we walk off of the carpeted area. So unfortunately, that gives us a hint that something's going to change, and it definitely does. And we come to our first display here in the museum that um, I have to tell you is the only display in the whole museum that's not in chronological order. The whole museum goes in the order of how events took place during the Holocaust, and here. Very much in the beginning, we have an event that takes place towards the end of the war. Okay, so I'm gonna stand in the middle here. What I'm gonna do is look at this big picture here. We're gonna take a step back. And we see here that we see a, a pile of bodies and they're piled up with wood and we see there's some soldiers in the background. Now, the, these pictures come from a work camp that was called Kluga, that was in a country called Estonia. And the pictures were taken in September of 1944. So like I said, very much towards the end of the war. And what happened was there were roughly about 2000 Jewish prisoners in this work camp. And they can, the, the front is moving in. The Soviet soldiers, that's who you see over here in the background, the allies, they are getting closer. The Jews can hear the battles taking place. They can hear the bombs going off in the background. They know the front is coming close. And unfortunately, what happens is the Nazis at that point, they take the Jews out of the camp and they start um, murdering them. They start shooting them. There were about 50 Jews or so that were able to run away and survive. And that's how we know the story. But the rest of the Jews were killed. And we see they pile up their bodies to burn them. Now, why burn them? We're just going to talk about that for one second to get rid of the evidence. And I'm going to pause here for one second. Very important that we point out um, when we talk about this idea, certainly as we go more and more years away from the Holocaust and the events that took place, this idea of Holocaust denial, 
is only becoming stronger. It's important to understand the origins of that, of Holocaust denial. Who were the first deniers of the Holocaust? The Nazis themselves. They didn't want anybody knowing what they were doing and we see it very clearly here. Now the allies, you see the Soviet soldiers, unfortunately they didn't get there in time to save most of the lives of the Jews, but they did get there in time to save a lot of the bodies. And some of you might be thinking to yourselves, well, really, you know, what good is that? The Jews were already killed. And it, maybe this is not your first exposure to learning about the Holocaust. And if it is, you'll understand that it really is a big deal because it's one of the only places in the entire story of the Holocaust that not only were the, the Jews were killed, but then their bodies weren't destroyed or they weren't buried in mass graves. And because of that, in this camp in particular, we can see they weren't wearing uniforms. I don't know if they ran out or if they never had in this camp, but the Jews were wearing the clothes they came, um, that they came in. And because of that, not only did the allies find the bodies, but they found those last few items that the Jews had in their pockets. And through what they had in their pockets, we were able to identify who a lot of these Jews were, which is something that we weren't able to do um, in, in, in most of the other cases where the Jews were killed. Now, first of all, it's actually, sadly, a very uh, fascinating case study in human nature to see what it is people have on them when they're reduced to what they can only hold in their pockets. I'm going to show you this side as well. Um, you see mostly, and literally the big picture is the history of what happened, but what's in the display that we have over here, the display is what was found in their pockets. It's the stories. And you'll see, first and foremost, they found photographs, photographs of loved ones, people who were important to them, um, family themselves sometimes. They also found documents and things like that. What kind of documents? They found um, birth certificates and marriage certificates. They found a lot also of diplomas and work cards. That's what they found mostly, believe it or not, the Jews were practical, right? They're being torn from their homes. They don't know where they're being taken. It's wartime. Wherever they go, they have to be able to support their families, right? So very practical. Now, why do we start with this display in the beginning of the museum when it seems like it should be at the end? Just like we said outside, we have this huge collective number of six million Jews that were murdered. This is one of the only places where we can give back the stories to the victims based on what we found in their pockets. So I do want to share with you, uh, in, with that spirit in mind, I want to share with you one story. And I want to show you this couple over here. Okay, let's see if I can move in a little bit. We have here Yaakov Lev and Lucia. And Yaakov Lev was the one, I apologize for that circle, I can't get rid of that. Yaakov Lev was the one who was killed in this war camp. And the picture was found in his pocket. Now what was also found in his pocket were these items over here. And this is actually his acceptance to medical school. Okay, now what happens is, um, a friend of Lucia's, she went through the Holocaust and survived and moved to Israel. And a friend of hers who survived Kluga um, was at Kluga. They had a picture display that they found all these photographs and he saw her picture and he brings it back to Israel to show her and she's in shock. And she says, you know, I only met him just before this, that this was picture was taken the summer before the war broke out. Her family and his family, they were both from Vilna and they were both at the same vacation resort outside of Vilna and they'd been introduced by a mutual friend. So you have a young Jewish man and a young Jewish woman, almost like a, a, a setup, and they were in nature all summer. They went boating and apple picking. And if you can see, I don't know if you can see closely here, they're doing, they're sitting on the porch of her cabin doing a crossword puzzle. She's got a pen in her hand and a bat. And she says, I only saw him once or twice after that before the war broke out. But what did even Lucy realize for the first time decades later when she discovered that this was one of the last pictures that he took with him when he left his house? That what, that he was in love with her. And that relationship never had time to develop because the war broke out. And what Lucia tells us is, we, you know, we, we can look at these items and say, on the one hand, very much so, they're a reflection of who the people were. Very much so, it's where they were born and who they were married to and what they did for a living. But she also says, if you look at the picture of her and him, 
and you look at his acceptance to medical school, she says also very much so, it's, um, it's a reflection of who he wanted to be, what he wanted his life to become, the woman he possibly wanted to marry, the job he wanted to have. Okay, so I share that with you just to put you in the spirit of our discussion today that um, very much so, I'm gonna talk about uh, what we call spiritual resistance. We're going to talk about um, resilience and very much so the hopes and the dreams that the Jews continue to show all throughout the difficult times they were in. Okay, so with that little introduction in mind, I do want to spend a few minutes kind of standing right here and taking a look out at the building that we're in and talking about the design of the building itself. Very much so when visitors come in. Um, they notice first and foremost that it seems almost like claustrophobic, like the um, walls are closing in on them. It gets narrow as it goes along. I'm not sure if you can see that from here. And very much so also people notice where we have natural light. We only have natural light at the end of the museum and we have natural light up on top. The sliver that comes in from the top of the triangular shape of the building. And when we think about light versus dark, we obviously think of good versus evil. Uh, we think of happiness versus sadness. We think of, 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 of hope versus despair. And so the light at the end of the tunnel, we'll discuss when we get there, okay? So we'll, we'll leave that to the end. But if we look at this light over here, and it goes all throughout, you can see all the way up here, all throughout the way in the museum. And when I ask visitors to speak to me about the design of the light, Many times there's two things they notice. One, they notice how high up it is, how unreachable it is, how unattainable it is. We could say that it represents, if it's representing, let's say hope, for example, we could say that it shows how hard it was for the Jews to be hopeful with everything that was happening to them. But they also notice that it's there all along the way and it never disappears. So we could be saying the opposite, that it shows how there was always a little bit of hope that the Jews clung to. And I would like to suggest to you that the design of the light that we see above is ambiguous on purpose because when we read accounts and we listen to the survivors and certainly things that were left behind by Jews that didn't survive, we understand that different Jews reacted differently. And not only that, sometimes they changed along the way. So sometimes they had a belief in God or sometimes they, um, they, they, they lost all their hope but then somebody restored their faith in humanity. So I just want everybody to keep that in mind. And the other thing I wanna show you, I'm gonna move up closer here, is that, ah, oh, great. You can see here that all along the way, there's barriers throughout the museum. You can't take a shortcut through. You're gonna see very much so today that you can only go on kind of like a zigzag path that's been given to you by the people that designed the museum. And I actually think that it's very symbolic of what happened to the Jews in the Holocaust. We look back years and years later and we think to ourselves, they should have done this, they should have done that, they should have uh, tried to do this and tried to do that. When we study the Holocaust, what we really begin to understand is that the um, Jews really, uh, everything that was done to them was meant to deceive them and ultimately to kill them. And so every decision they made didn't really make so much of a difference in the end. They really had very, very few options and certainly very few options that had any good endings. Okay, so I want to share that with you. The other thing is if you look across the museum, you'll notice something else. And that is that you can't see into any of the galleries. And what you'll notice is that when we're in each gallery, you can't really see into the next one until you get in there. And again, I think it's very symbolic of what happened to the Jews in the Holocaust. We live in a world now where, a unfortunately, where a Holocaust happened. They lived in a world that had never seen a Holocaust before. And I would like to suggest to you that, in fact, Jewish history, if we look back on it, had taught us that this actually would not happen. We had gone through tough times before and it would get bad, but then it get better, it would get bad and then we get better. And so we were actually <clears throat> really, um, I should say trained that something like this wouldn't happen. And also um, when you see into one gallery, you don't see into the next one until you get there because because they couldn't have the knowledge that we have looking back and because they couldn't see it coming. 
every time something happened along the way, they never could have anticipated how horrible the next stage would be because they didn't have the knowledge we have. And in fact, I want to share with you the words of my friend's father, um, who only recently passed away about two years ago. He was a teenage survivor of Loach. He and his brother, they found themselves alone in one of the worst ghettos to be in. And we'll talk about what that was if people don't know, but they found themselves alone, two teenagers, and they volunteered to go to Auschwitz. Why did they volunteer to go to Auschwitz? Because they thought to themselves, no place on earth could be worse than where they were at the time in Loach. And how does he start the next chapter? He says, and then we found out something could be worse. Okay, so that's our introduction to the building and have that in mind as, as we go through. Now, we are going to go into the first gallery over here. Now, remember, we did say that we have this, um, this theme of spiritual resistance. So we're not going to be able to see everything, but I'm going to try and show you something from every gallery that um, is associated with the theme of spiritual resistance. Now, the first gallery does start where we think it should start with the rise of Hitler. Now, when we come in here, I just want to show you, um, we do have some posters, campaign posters of Hitler, Hitler coming to power. And I wanna remind uh, all of us here what Germany was like on the eve of the war, right? It was um, in shambles. They had lost World War I. They were blamed for World War I. They had to pay a lot of money in reparations. They were limited the land they could have, the troops they could have, and that was devastating for the Germans. Inflation and unemployment were skyrocketing. Now, if we look at Hitler's campaign posters, of course he's promising them jobs and things like that, but I, I just wanna show you this, this, this um, poster here, which if we talk about subliminal advertising, on the one hand, he's promising them jobs and I'll make uh, Germany better for you, but look what he promises them here. And if you can see it, there we go. I'm getting as close as I can. Look at the German here. First of all, look at how exaggerated his muscles are, right? That's, he's promising them strength. Look at how he's standing. Look at his posture. He's standing tall with pride. This is not somebody who's shameful after they lost a war. Look at how he towers over the other people. He is superior to everybody else there. And if you look at the swastika on the back, that is not your regular, like normally we see a swastika drawn on in black. And this is a a concrete structure that will not blow away with the first wind that comes along. And he's promising them stability. And all of that he's promising them in this one poster, okay? So Hitler comes to power, but we also have the words of the people who were there. And I wanna bring to you the words, or I should say the testimony. I wanna show you if I can go in closely here. Um, we talk about spiritual resistance and different people resisted in different ways. So I'm bringing to you now something uh, shown to you that, that, that I wanna show you that was done by an artist. Her name was Charlotte Solomon. And Charlotte Solomon was a young woman from Germany. She tried to run to France. And unfortunately, we know as many of the Jews, they didn't run far enough. She was caught in France and from France, she was she had actually just gotten married and was expecting her first uh, baby. She was pregnant and she was sent to Auschwitz and she was killed. But she painted hundreds of paintings and many of them document what's going on for us. And so first of all, I wanna show you what she paints here, if you can see it, um, describing the rise of Hitler. And I'm getting as close as I can um, in the museum and you see here, she puts on the date, you can see, right? The date that Hitler comes to power, January 30th, 1933. Now, if you look closely, you'll notice that not only does she draw the people of Germany, right? They're all standing behind the Nazi flag. They're all the same. And I hope you can see this up close, but if you pay attention, they all have little mustaches. What is she showing you that already, in 1933, she can see the people of Germany are all turning into mini Hitlers. They're all following Hitler um, and, and everything that he has to, to, to give them. It's a very, very powerful statement. Uh, now I bring that to you because for Charlotte Solomon, her resistance is her art, her painting. And we continue with her in this gallery so that when Hitler comes to power, and things start getting bad for the Jews, and we're going to jump ahead over here, okay, and we see, I'm going to stand right here with you, um, we can see here the anti-Jewish propaganda that comes, 
In fact, I'm going to show you this. Not only do we have all these anti-Jewish images, but look at this. We actually have here a, chill, a baby's book with anti-Jewish images. And here we have a board game for children called Juden Rouse, called Out with the Jews. And if we want to talk about the Germans jumping on board, this wasn't produced by the Nazis. This was produced by a private toy manufacturer. Okay, so it's called Out with the Jews. This is what's taking place in Germany. And, and, and Charlotte Solomon is living through this. And Hitler comes to power. And there's a boycott of Jewish businesses. And um, it gets very bad right away for the Jews and all the anti-Jewish legislation. How does Charlotte so show us the anti-Jewish legislation? Take a look. And we see here her father, Albert Solomon, Dr. Albert Solomon, not only is he a surgeon, but you can see from the picture on top, there's all these doctors around him. He's so successful that he is a teaching surgeon. He is actually considered one of the grandfathers of mammography. And he, even with as prominent as he is, when the laws come out and the Jews start to lose their jobs and they can't go to, um, they, they, they lose their access to parks and they lose their access to all the, um, everything in Germany, their, 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 their money is taken away from them. When all the anti-Jewish laws come out, he's a part of that. And he's pulled out of surgery, never to perform surgery again in a general hospital in Germany. And her stepmother, actually, her mother has already died. Her father remarried. She's a stage performer. She is banished off stage never to perform again. Okay, so he, she shows us plain and clear in her painting what's happening. She is documenting for us, and this is a form of resistance, leaving behind what's happening, expressing to us through her painting. Okay, now, <clears throat> We know it gets very bad for the Jews, and um, we're going to continue on in the museum because I promised you a little bit in every gallery. Here, um, as we come around, remember I told you that you can't see into each of the galleries until you get into the next one. We are going to jump ahead, and, um, and there's much to talk about here about the rise of Nazism and what happens in Germany and how the Jews react, but we're going to go to back to the middle of the museum, and we come now to the date of September 1st, 1939. Hitler invades Poland. We have the official start of World War II. I should remind you just so we remember our history that Hitler's already gone into uh, certain parts of Czechoslovakia and he's already taken over Austria. Okay, but now he goes into Poland. And when he goes into Poland, um, what we have in the museum here is first of all, again, we have the history. I show you, we have a map, we explain to people what happened, but we also have the human word. And here we have it through the written word. Before we had it through art, here we have it through the written word. And I want to introduce you to a very, here, if I can show you this picture, Ooh, forget here, bear with me, yeah. You can see here this picture, David Cherikoviak, um, really such an intelligent and witty teenager. Um, he didn't even make it past his teens. He was in the Lodge Ghetto, which was just an, uh, really, like we said before, uh, my father's, uh, my friend's father, they, they volunteer, voluntarily left the Lodge because it was so bad. He was there. And you can see here, he keeps a diary. And he records what happens. He very much um, talks about the rumors that go around, what he sees happening. And, and, and sadly enough, he ends up actually recording in a way his own death because he talks about how weak he gets and the kind of help he's hoping to get and the friends that help him and how his mother's taken away and it goes on and on and on. And eventually David Cherkoviak, he actually dies from what we can call, we call sometimes ghetto disease, which is just starvation, exhaustion, the body falling apart, exposure, all of those things. And unfortunately, um, he does die in the ghetto from the conditions. But his a lot of his diaries survived, not all of it. Um, some of the middle we can tell was taken, we think to be used uh, to burn for heat, but quite a few of the books survived. You can, you can buy his diary on Amazon and it's really, I highly recommend um, everybody reading if they can. Now we have, he, his resistance, his way to keep up his spirits in any way, he even talks about the need he has to write. And it keeps a diary for us. And here, I'll give you an example of light that he sheds in his diary to help us understand what's going on, right? Just with the invasion of Poland. Okay, so what does he write in his diary? He tells us, 
God, here, I, know, I, I hope you can all read with me. He said, God, what's going on here? Panic, mass exodus, the city waits fearfully for the anticipated arrival of the German troops. I go to sleep, but a loud conversation wakes me at five in the morning. A neighbor is sitting there with his wife telling us that we have to leave. Where to? To go where? Why? Nobody knows to flee as far as possible from the danger. What, what do we learn from him? Right, he tells us in just this little paragraph that again, some things may, they may seem so easy for us to think of doing, but really, when it comes to running away and everybody's running away and the roads are clogged and you have nowhere to go and you have no family to go to, um, we see that some people they did run away, but they didn't run away far enough. Let's so say they ran to France. Look at Anne Frank; she ran to Holland. Again, they always they Jews sometimes thought that would be far enough, but here we have right in the midst of a war. And the, the thought of running away, on the one hand, you can see they're saying we have to go. And on the other hand, they're saying, well, where to? And how do we get there? And what do we do about that? So we see this um, very much so the, the Jews find themselves with all these dilemmas. They find themselves in a panic. They don't know what to do. His family ends up staying in Lodz. And that's, um, and of course, I told you the, the end of that story, all of them, they all end up, he and his mother and his father and his sister, they all um, end up not surviving. Now, when we're in this area, there's one other thing that I do want to show you when we talk about the invasion of Poland uh, and what happens and what the Germans, what the Germans do. And especially when we talk about spiritual resistance. And I want to point out here, I, I we're, we're going to come over here. I hope this is the right spot. Ooh, right there. Okay. This is something that I'm sure everybody's seen from every picture of the, that they've seen from the Holocaust. So the Jews have to wear this badge. And it almost always looks like this, right? These yellow badges with the word um, Jew written, whatever language of the country that they're from. I do want to show you, we have another type also, that sometimes you will see the Jews in the area of the, the middle of Poland, like Warsaw, for example. The badge they had to wear looked more like the Israeli flag. So you'll see that every now and then, but mostly they were these yellow badges. Now, this is where I tell people, rightfully so, when we think of the Holocaust, we really are so overwhelmed with the mass murder of six million Jews, with the industrial nature of the murder of six million Jews. And sometimes, because we're so overwhelmed with that, unfortunately, we sometimes tend to forget what happened to them all along the way and how much they suffered as um, the Holocaust was taking place. And I remind people here, when we look at the badge, okay, I want to show you, we know the Jews had to wear the badge, but I want to show you what we have right here. Now, I'm going to move to this area. Now I'm kind of like up in the air over here. And I want to show you, I'm sorry, this sketch. We have here this sketch of this young Jewish woman that has to wear the badge. This was done by an artist. Her name is Esther Lurie. Esther Lurie, she did survive, but this is very interesting. She had already moved to Israel. She was living in Israel and going to art school in Israel, but she had left her family behind. So when you miss your family, what do you do? You go back to visit. She had gone back to visit and the war broke out and she got caught up in the Holocaust. She suffered through the whole Holocaust, even though she'd already moved to Israel, but she did survive. Now she draws this sketch of a young Jewish woman that has to wear the badge. And again, we might think, well, wearing the badge compared to everything else that happened later on is nothing. Right, and that's true with that perspective, with that knowledge. But look at how she draws this young woman that has to wear a badge. Again, we see light and dark. You see how her face is very dark and shadowy. So it's despair, it's good versus evil, it's sadness versus happiness. We look, we saw the posture when we were looking at the poster, right, with the German. Look at her posture. This this Jewish girl can only woman can only hold her head down in shame. And if you look at the way that the badges, the, the stars are drawn on her, if you pay attention, it looks almost like a bullet hole going right through her. And it's hard for us to imagine with everything that came after, but believe it or not, we have testimony after testimony where the Jews literally use words like wearing the badge, it kills me. 
We have diaries from 10 year old children that say, I won't step out of my house. I won't go to school if I have to wear that badge. And again, we have to remember the experience of the Jews all along the way. And this is one place where I think uh, we can really see that. And of course, um, Esther Luria, because she was an artist, she shows us this through, again, through her artwork. Okay, so now we're going to leave this area. And of course, we are moved along by the history. So I do want to show you that when we come into the middle area over here, we see the wars continuing and Hitler is conquering more and more countries all throughout Europe. Everywhere he goes, who lives there? Jews, right? And we already know um, that they can't, the Germans can't tolerate living with Jews, but they keep, so to speak, inheriting more and more. And so what they do after they go into <clears throat> Poland, which by the way, they inherited about 2 million Jews in Poland. There were 3.3 million that lived there and the part that was given to the Soviet Union left them with 2 million Jews and they gain even more with the invasion of these countries. So what they do is they, they really have some ideas that they're throwing about, about what they're gonna do with the Jews. They're gonna send them all to the island of Madagascar is one of the ideas, for example. But until then, they can't tolerate living with the Jews. So they decide that wherever they go, they're gonna put the Jews in one area of that city or that village, so to speak, and we call these the ghettos. Uh, the ghettos, I, I guess we could say, in essence, they were somewhat open air prisons. The Jews were forced to live there, Almost all the ghettos you see here, this is the big brick wall going up around the Warsaw Ghetto. The ghettos, for the most part, there we count, uh, Yad Vashem counts 1,100 ghettos. They were almost all in Eastern Europe. There was only one that was in Western Europe, and that was Theresienstadt, that was um, outside Prague, and what was Czechoslovakia at the time. Here, this is in Amsterdam, but you can see it's really a Jewish quarter. It's not enclosed like the ghettos were in Eastern Europe. Um, you see this Jewish man, he's still marked, he can, but he can go in and out. That's interesting though, I, I will point out to you is that while the experience may have been different, this seems obviously like it was a lot more pleasant than this was, the end result unfortunately really wasn't very different. 90% of the Jews of Poland are killed in the Holocaust and anywhere we can say 70 to 80% of the Jews of Holland are killed in the Holocaust. So very similar numbers. Okay, now when we talk about the Jews being enclosed in the ghettos and other kinds of holding camps, we're not getting into the, the we're, we're talking about concentration camps or labor camps or what we call transit camps, things like that. Before we actually go into the area of the ghettos, I want to stop over here and show you something that I think is um, really remarkable. And we have a camp uh, in France called Copienia, and it was in northern France, and it actually held mostly political prisoners, but there were Jews there. And of of course, if we would look at the camp, it was bad for everyone, but the Jews had it the worst. The Jews were kept separate. They were kept behind a double layer of um, barbed wire. And it was just the conditions were even it, as bad as anybody can imagine. And they were doing labor all day. But look what we have. I wanna show you, and I hope you can see them again as close as I can. In here, if you can see, we have this, this box and we have this mirror. They were done by a man, his name is Alexander Prigozhin. And I don't know if you can see, it looks almost like they're mosaic, right? You can see it's white with little cracks in it, but it's not what it was. What they are doing here, these are eggshells. Eggshells that were broken and then glued onto these items. But these aren't the only items we have. And there were a few different artists that did this kind of artwork in this camp in France. And I bring that to you because first of all, there, there were quite a few artists in this camp because they were Jews that came to Paris for the art culture that was there to begin with. And they end up in this camp together. And what they do is they, because they're artists, they engage in that whenever they can. Now, they were in horrible conditions, like I said, absolutely horrible conditions, working all day. 
And think about the patience that it takes to crack eggshells and glue each piece on to be the background for your artwork. Now, I don't know if it was a new kind of artwork they were practicing together or that's all they had at their disposal, but I can tell you, we see here just the desire to be creative, right? The desire to move on. And it was definitely something that <clears throat> I haven't heard that they had done before. It was definitely something created exclusively in this camp. And so I really want to show it to you because I think it's, it, it's a piece of artwork, a kind of artwork, but so unusual and so different and really shows us uh, the need that artistic people feel to always be creating. So I want to share that with you. And now we will move into the area of some of the ghettos. And um, I'm going to take you right over here. We talked about writing before and we saw David Cherkoviak Ch and how he kept a diary. Now I'm going to turn you around over here. And we have another, this is another boy, a young boy who was in Lodz, but he didn't keep a diary. He kept a writing journal. And in that writing journal, there's many writings that he does, but one of them is a long poem. We have a little part of it here that I want to share with you. The poem is called Dream. His name is, you can see, Abramek Koplovich. He was 14 years old when he was killed in Auschwitz. But look what he writes in the ghetto, in the Lodge ghetto. When I grow up and get to be 20, I'll travel and see this world of plenty. In a bird with an engine, I will sit myself down, take off and fly into space far above the ground. I'll fly, I'll cruise and soar up high above a world so lovely into the sky. And the poem goes on, but it, we see here, this is completely different than what David Cherkoviak was doing, even what um, we see, let's say Charlotte Solomon was doing, or even we saw Esther Lurie, they were all recording what was happening, but they were using whatever creative expression they wanted to, to um, um, leave for us or for themselves even a record of what was happening. But here we see a boy who clearly loves to write. It's, it, it, you can tell he's so talented. We see he's writing about his hopes and his dreams. And we see that he actually really, even in Lodge, he has hope that he'll survive and one day be able to travel um, as he dreams. Now, unfortunately, he did not survive. His father survived and his father was the one that found the notebook where they had hidden it. Uh, before they were taken to Auschwitz. But I am going to turn you around over here and on the other wall opposite of it, I do want to show you something. Um, and you'll forgive me, I don't know how I kind of got suspended in the air here, but you'll see here another diary. Now this is a diary, again, also from Lodz. We don't know who wrote it. We can tell it was a teenager, he had a sister. We know that from some of the stories. But the reason, why, and again, he also records what happens. First, I want to show you. I don't know if you can see there's different paragraphs there. He writes in four different languages. He writes in Polish. He writes in Yiddish. He writes in Hebrew. And he writes in English. Okay, so clearly an extremely intelligent young man. I also take a look at what he writes on. This young man, he doesn't have a journal. He doesn't have a diary. He's so desperate to write that what does he do? He takes a book and he writes in the margins. It is the only thing he has to write, but you can, you, you can feel how compelled he feels to write, that he needs to put down in writing um, all his trials and tribulations and, and, and his experiences in the ghetto. And really some of his, what he reports is heart-wrenching. He's uh, brutally honest about himself even. He even records the time when he steals his sister's slice of bread. The internal agony he has with himself, the decision, the going back and forth and how he then he steals the bread and he eats it because he really can't help himself. And then when the family returns, he has to curse the scoundrel that would steal the slice of bread of a, of, of a little girl. And we can only imagine the poor agony that this young man went through, but that's his writing. And again, we see just the need he has to create and he does it through writing. Now we go into the area of the Warsaw ghetto. And the first thing I wanna do is I'm gonna take you all the way down here, forgive me. Um, 
I'm jumping around a little bit. I'm sorry about that, but I want to show you just to give you an idea of the Warsaw Ghetto. We have this picture here. When we talk about the Warsaw Ghetto, okay, it was the um, largest ghetto that the Germans made. On the eve of the war, 30% of Warsaw was Jewish. 30%, 300,000 Jews lived in Warsaw. When they made the ghetto, they took that 30% of the population and, wait, you know what, I forgot. I'm gonna make it. I'm sorry about that. They made the um, they they made the ghetto less than three percent area of the city. Okay, I'm gonna say that again. They took thirty percent of the population and moved it into an area that was less than three percent. And if we thought that was bad enough, they didn't stop at that. They then moved in another hundred and fifty thousand Jews from neighboring villages, and they brought them into the Warsaw ghetto. So we're talking about 450,000 people in this tiny space. And that is why what you see in this photograph here, you see it was so overcrowded, they had to make the streets one way for walking. This policeman here, right, he's directing foot traffic because if they didn't do that, people couldn't get where they were going. The kind of congestion we're talking about, we're talking about 50 people to one apartment. They say that's on average seven or eight people per room. Okay, so of course, we, we know all the problems that came with that in terms of hygiene and the lack of food and the lack of resources and all those problems. And I bring you over here to this part and everything you see, just, you know, this is all original, donated from Warsaw to Yad Vashem, this cart over here, the train tracks, the cobblestone, this lamppost, they're all original from Warsaw. This cart we have over here, we'd like to think that it was used to peddle food or bread, and maybe it wasn't the beginning, but ultimately, what was it unfortunately used for? To put bodies in. 80,000 uh, 80, to 100,000 Jews died from the conditions in the Warsaw Ghetto. That's how bad it was. And it was so bad that eventually the rabbis, and in Jewish tradition, Burial is one of the um, strictest of laws that we have and proper burial of every person. It was such an extreme situation that even the most religious of the rabbis, they said we could have that they could have mass graves in the Warsaw Ghetto because the situation was so severe. Now it's interesting, I think it's, it, it, it's really a beautiful tribute to the Jews of the Warsaw Ghetto, the way Yad Vashem made this display because right here we have the cart that represents all the death that was taking place but what do we have behind it we have the posters the posters that reflect the lives the jews made for themselves in the ghetto and you don't have to know polish or yiddish or german to see this over here and see it says concert and symphony Okay, so we have, we know we have musical productions going on. We'll get to that in a second. And I want to show you something else that I find really unbelievable. And it's a little harder for you to see, but, um, and it's a different language, but you see this word is repeated over here. Pletim, pletim, it's a, it's a Hebrew word. And what it really means is it means refugee. And they're making announcements. They're saying, refugee, go here if you need food. If you need kosher food, go here. Refugee, if you need help with this, refugee. Who are these refugees? What, what are they talking about? Remember I told you about the 150,000 Jews from the neighboring villages that were brought into the Warsaw Ghetto? Those are the refugees. Now imagine the Jews in the Warsaw Ghetto with as little as they had, they realized what? That there were people that had even less. And I bring this to you because all throughout the time, as bad as it got in the Warsaw Ghetto, we see all the time the Jews in pursuit of helping each other as much as they could. The idea of charity, right? There were, there, there were dozens of soup kitchens in the Warsaw Ghetto, but the people who were, who were distributing the food, they were starving themselves. But as much as they could, we see that the Jews, they uh, engaged in this idea of charity is really as much as they could. Um, we do have a story I want to share with you when we talk about this idea of charity. We have the memoirs of a survivor, Helena Birnbaum, and she also wrote a beautiful book you can buy on Amazon called Hope is the Last to Die. Now, it's a little different than a diary because she writes with the perspective of, of, of an adult. So it's a different kind of... Um, of telling of her story. And it's interesting, she as a young girl in the Warsaw Ghetto, 
she was on the street and she saw a beggar and she went up and she said to her mom, I'm taking a little bit of money or a piece of bread to bring down to the beggar in the street. And her mother said she couldn't. And she was in shock because they always gave charity in the past. And then she writes as an adult, she says, you know why? My younger self could not understand that my mother knew the day was soon coming where we wouldn't have enough money to feed ourselves. And what did she do? She snuck down with that piece of bread or whatever the 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 little bit of money that she that that she could get, and she gave it to the to the beggar on the street, which I actually think um, really is a beautiful story about her mother and the values that she had instilled in her daughter. Um, so I wanted to share that with you. But as we're talking about, we saw the performances. Like if we go into this room over here, and, oops, sorry about no, sorry about that. I'm gonna back out there. We see here that we have. A picture will look like a wedding. Now, if we turn to these photographs over here, what do we see? These are actually plays. There were five theaters in the Warsaw Ghetto. There were theaters in the, in the Ludge Ghetto. There were theaters in the Vilna Ghetto. Okay, so we have these performances that it almost seems uh, kind of absurd to have theater going on in places where people are literally dying day by day. But I think we think of this idea of a spiritual resistance and the desire to um, continue, right? To hold on to their humanity when it's being taken away from them and to hold on to continuity in a world that's growing more and more chaotic. Then we stop asking how they had these theaters and we, we begin to understand why they had to have them. Um, and I'll share with you two things. Speaking of David Cherkovia, remember we mentioned him in the first gallery, and I told you how bright he was and how witty. He talked about going to one of these performances, and you know what? He's very critical. He says, it really wasn't up to my standards. I didn't like it so much, but you know what? At least I got away from my life for an hour. He admits that, and we can very much see how the theater was, was not just a place for the actors to act and for people who enjoyed culture before the war to go and continue. It was also a place of escape. Escape. I will also share with you, we have a musicologist that comes to Yad Vashem and she speaks and she also reminds us of something else, which I think is just remarkable. When you buy a ticket to go to a show and you give your ticket to the usher, where does the usher take you to? He takes you to your seat. He or she takes you to your seat. Now imagine, I just told you seven or eight people per room. The streets were one way for walking. Can we imagine what having their own seat or their own space just for one hour, possibly meant to a Jew in the Warsaw Ghetto, right? So maybe there we understand also why <clears throat> the, the Jews uh, went to the theater as well, another reason. Okay, so with that, we're going to exit and I want to show you one thing. Uh, there's so much I want to show you. Uh, we don't have time for everything, but I'm coming into the area of the true of Therese and Statues. Terrazin, which I told you was the only ghetto uh, slash camp. It has some characteristics of a ghetto, some characteristics of a camp, but it was the only one that was in Western Europe. It was outside of Prague, it was Czechoslovakia. I don't wanna show you this. Look what we have here. We have this Monopoly game. Now this Monopoly game was donated, you can see right on the side here, it was donated to Yad Vashem. There were brothers, Pavel and Thomas Glass. And what's interesting that as young children in Theresienstadt, they don't remember how they got the Monopoly game. They, they, we know that it was made by an adult by the name of Oswald Peck, and we know that he made it for the children. And the assumption is it got passed along and passed along by children uh, from one to the other, and they were the ones that eventually ended up with it. Now, you can see here, it's a very special Monopoly game it's we're used now we're used to the you know Mon monopoly new york or monopoly toronto right you're canadian so throw that out there um but in those days it was just monopoly and they made a monopoly that on the one hand was to teach the children the the ghetto where things were and so they would understand the ghetto but when we think about it also when we're looking at this what do we have here is resistance play, play time for children. These are children that are thrust into a world of adults. These are children that have to go and labor day in and day out, right? Their, their, their childhoods are literally 
swept away from underneath them. And what do the adults in Therese and Scott realize? They realize that these children, they need at least at some point during the day to return to being children. So here we see game time. We see play time itself as the resistance, okay? And that was the, um, the adults that provided for the children, but yet we, we do see that. So really, I think that I wanted to share that with you. Now, we're gonna leave this area and we're gonna move on, um, unfortunately, with the history. And we're gonna come to the, I'm gonna try to get you right here in the middle of the museum. I hope everybody's okay with all the movement. Where we're standing right now is the lowest point in the museum. We've been on an, Dec we've been going um, on a decline the entire time. We're standing the lowest point in the museum because we do come to the date of June 22nd, 1941. And that's when Germany invades the Soviet Union. And what happens when Germany invades the Soviet Union is the war changes. And this is where we have the mass extermination of the Jews really begin. If up until now, Jews have been killed by violence, from the Germans and from their collaborators and from the conditions that they've been subjected to. Many of them have died already. However, the, the mass extermination begins with the invasion of the Soviet Union. Okay, and of course, that starts with the shooting pits. And as they go into um, the Soviet Union, they are gathering up the Jews. Hitler establishes new troops called the Einsatzgruppen and their job is unfortunately literally to gather up the Jews and kill them and to shoot them. Now, the latest, the latest research we have, we used to say even less, now 2.2 million Jews, we believe. Those are the latest numbers that came from David Zoverklang at Yad Vashem. 2.2 million Jews were killed in, in the shooting pits. Now, even with the shooting pits, I wanna show you what we have here. Okay, we're, you can say, unfortunately, we have many pictures of these murders taking place because these murders were taking place right where the people lived, in forests, in ravines, uh, at beaches, very near to where uh, the people were. But look what we have here. And this is un unbelievable. Look at this. It looks like it's a poem, but really it's a song. And if you can read closely here, now Ponar, just so I can explain to you, is uh, the site of the mass murder of the Jews of Vilna. Vilna, um, was in, you know, was um, Lithuania. And so that is where, um, where uh, at the part where the mass murder of the Jews begin. So the ghetto of Vilna, unlike what we saw with Lodz and what we saw with Warsaw, the ghetto there's established after tens of thousands of Jews have already been killed. And rumors start to come back and the Jews understand that all these Jews that have been taken away, they've been murdered. And look what we have here. We actually have, I don't know if you can see this, it's a song. It says, the song was written, I'm gonna try and get as close as I can, in the Vilna Ghetto in April of 1943. The lyrics you can see are by Shmuel Kazerzynski. And it also you see here the music was by Alec, right? It says Volkovsky, who then became Alexander Tamir. He did survive. He was 11 years old. And what happened in Vilna? right, and the, in the shadow of all the tens of thousands of Jews being killed, what do they have? They have a competition. They have a, I guess you could call it a composition competition. They have the lyrics and they have a competition for the music and an 11 year old boy wins that competition. So we saw before that the Jews were playing music, right, in the ghettos, they were having concerts and symphonies and they were having plays and things like that. But here we even have the, um, the writing of music, which when we think about it in the situation they found themselves in is to, we think, I mean, I think a lot of us, songs can be sad, but also we think of, 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 of we think of music, we think of beauty, and we think of this 11 year old boy so talented and thank god he did survive so we were able to <laughs> continue enjoying his his talents as the years went on but think about that they were not just playing music they were composing music all throughout the holocaust and certainly here uh, in the shadow of these um extermination the mass extermination so i wanted to share that with you now as we go on we know that um they were killing the jews and the shooting pits and they continued to shoot Jews all throughout the war, but they did change the method that, of 
the way they were going to kill the Jews. And now we have the gas chambers. We have the extermination camps. Uh, keeping track of time here. Okay, and so um, here we have an area where we talk about the Wannsee Conference, where they discuss the gas chambers, what they call the final solution to the Jewish problem. But after that meeting, they started building these extermination camps. And what I want to show you here in this area is so when we talk about the mass murder of the Jews and them being taken now out of the ghettos, they're being taken to their deaths in the gas chambers. I also want to share with you resistance that we see here, spiritual resistance. And if you don't know who this man is, I'm going to try and get as close as I can. I don't know if you can see his picture there, Janusz Korshak. Okay, so that was his pen name. Uh, his original Jewish name was Henrik Goldschmidt. And he was what I could call a, a beloved pediatrician doctor in, in Poland. He had radio shows. He was very, very famous and very, very popular, not just amongst the Jews. In general, in Poland, everybody knew who he was. But because he was this pediatrician, he was this doctor, he really had in his heart such a love love for children. And so he ran orphanages. And of course, at one point, the Jewish orphanage is moved into the ghetto, the Warsaw ghetto, and he moves in with them. Here we have his eyeglasses um, that at some point he left behind. And the story about Janusz Korczak that I want to share with you is that, like I said, he was so well known and so popular. He had multiple, many, many opportunities to escape the ghetto to leave and especially when the Jews start to be taken out um, in the summer of 1942. We have what's called the um, mass deportation. The Jews uh, over a three month period, nearly 300,000 Jews are taken out of the Warsaw Ghetto to be killed in the gas chambers. Janusz Korczak is given the chance to escape. And of course, what does he say? He says, I'm not, I'm not leaving my children. He knows where he's going. The children don't, he knows. And I want, if I can, you know what, I'm gonna try and get a little closer here because I do wanna to read to you um, this description we have of him. And there's many people that describe the orphans walking with Janusz Korshak to the train station. But look what, it, look what this person we have here, this, um, this eyewitness account, it says, here that on August 5th, 1942, during the Great Deportation, the Germans ordered um, deportation from orphanages to the Umschlagplatz, that was the train station, and from there to Treblinka, that was the gas chambers where they're going to be killed. A witness described the scene. The children walk in lines of four with Korshak at their head, his eyes gazing straight ahead. This was not a march, I don't know if you can see it, this was not a march off to the cattle cars, but a silent, disciplined protest against murder. Okay, so I really think that's a beautiful account of what happened. We know he dressed them, many accounts talk about how he dressed them in their best clothes. He kept them calm. He didn't tell them where they were going, even though he knew, obviously, and he stayed with them and embraced them all the way until the very end. So here we see resistance, not armed resistance. We see spiritual resistance by really ultimately giving your own life to help others, to make it easier for the children. And when we come here um, into the area of the extermination camps, I just want to point out to you that after that meeting, they set up three camps, Treblinka, Sobobor, and Belzitz. And these are in the area of Poland. These are camps. They are extermination camps only. This is not Auschwitz where we have a selection process. Almost all the Jews that come to these camps, they arrive that morning. They die that day. They pull a few really just very few out of the thousands and thousands that come a day, they pull a few that look strong or that maybe have special skills to help them on the camp or to do the dirty work of disposing of the bodies. But really mostly the Jews, um, there, there are only a few Jews kept alive um, in horrible, horrible, horrible conditions um, and to run the camp and do the work that the Germans and their Ukrainian um, auxiliary guards don't wanna do. Even in Treblinka, even in Treblinka, we have stories of people that try to save other people's lives. Um, there's an area, and it's only in Tripoli, it's not in the other camps where they come, it's called the sorting area, and there's piles of belongings from the Jews of their clothes. And if they can, and maybe they recognize somebody, or maybe they just feel like they wanna help somebody, the inmates there will 
they sometimes will push one of the incoming Jews into the pile of clothes when nobody's looking. Now, sometimes those Jews, they don't know what's happened. They jump up and of course, that's not what they should do, but some of the Jews have the wherewithal to stay down and they join the workforce and therefore, at least for the moment, their lives are saved. And the Jews in Tripoli, that they do this at the risk of being caught and being killed themselves. So even in Treblinka, which is uh, it was the worst, some of the worst of the worst, we see Jews um, doing their best to hold on to their humanity and to help other Jews as much as they could. Now we're coming into the area over here of <clears throat> um, the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. And I want to show you um, the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising happened after most of the Jews are taken out. There's only about 50 or 60,000 Jews left. And it's April of 1943. And I don't have time to go into the whole story here, but I do want to show you, we have pictures here. And first of all, I want to bring you and show you this picture, right? I'm sure you've all seen it. It's one of the most famous pictures uh, that people see from the Holocaust, a little boy being, being held up at gunpoint. But I wanna show you this picture over here. This might be a new one for you. Look at this Jewish woman being held up at gunpoint. She's not even raising her hands. You know, we've been looking a lot at, let's say posture, right? Look at this woman and what do we see in her? I think we say, we can see pride, we see a little bit defiance. She's refusing to hold up her hands. Her, um, her, she's standing tall and straight. And I can suggest to you that we can compare this maybe to a different young woman that we saw, maybe a sketch of a young woman. And remember, we saw that young woman that Esther Lurie drew that she had to wear the badge and she could only hold her head down in shame. And I could suggest to you that here, what the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising gave back to the Jews was their ability to hold their heads high again. It, it, there, there's nobody that will say the Jews that revolted in the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, it was the youth group leaders that really led the revolt. None of them really thought that they would survive, right? But take a look here. The words of Mordechai Anilowitz, who was one of the leaders of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, and he actually was killed in the battle. But look what he writes just a few days before he's killed. And I, I believe he's 23 years old only when he writes this, okay, when he uh, is a leader in the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising and, and, and decides to take on, in essence, the entire German army, right, 23 years old. And look what he writes. My life's dream has come true. Self-defense in the ghetto has become a fact. Armed Jewish resistance and revenge are actually happening. I've witnessed the glorious and heroic combat of the Jewish fighters. So I'm not taking away the armed resistance that took place, but I will say that there certainly was an element of a spiritual resistance that went hand in hand with this armed resistance. Um, and now we come to the area of the museum where we talk about Auschwitz. The three extermination camps that we saw before. By the end of 1943, there's revolts in two of them. Most of the Jews of Poland are already killed. And so the Germans destroy those camps. They plow them down and plant Ukrainian farmers there as if nothing happened. But Hitler's conquering more and more countries. There's a war still going on. He is Jews that he needs to send away. Auschwitz becomes the camp that's bigger and the most centrally located. And that's where he sends the Jews, where the Jews are sent. Now remember that even though we have um, selection process in Auschwitz, it very much is an extermination camp. 85 to 90 percent of the Jews that arrive in Auschwitz die the day they come. Only 10 to 50 percent are chosen to work, and we sometimes even say they're chosen to work to death, because unfortunately the conditions were there were just as bad as in all the other camps. But I want to show you something pretty remarkable that we have. We have here um, an album that was found. It's called the Auschwitz album. It was found by a survivor, her name is Lily Jacobs, and Lily Jacobs, she actually found it in a different camp when the war was over, a camp that she was, she was taken to, which is remarkable. She opens the album, she finds it in the drawer of a Nazi bunker that she's in. She opens it up and she sees the rabbi of her town, she sees her brothers, and she sees herself. Okay, so there's, uh, we have some of the pictures blown up here, and it, it, it's showing the selection process of Jews coming to Auschwitz. 
And um, we do know that it's a little bit of a watered down version of what happened, meaning it is what happened, but we don't see people getting shot in the platform. We don't see dogs barking and screaming. We don't see a lot of chaos, which is generally described by survivors, but we do have these photographs and we do want to use them. And I want to show you something here. If we look up close, I don't know if you can see, um, we have the Jews arriving and you can see they're getting lined up to be divided, but look at this Jew over here. That's a prisoner. You can see he's in prisoner uniform. He's a part of what's called the Canada Commando. And the Canada Commando, their job was to sort through the stuff that the Jews left behind. But because they were doing that, they were also, their job was to help the Jews off of the train, off of the cattle car. Now look if you can, I don't know if you can see closely, it looks like it's almost the same person based on the cap he's wearing and it's a little hard to see. But here, he's talking to this woman. Now, what we do know is that this was forbidden. They were not allowed to talk to the Jews that arrived. Do we know what he's saying? We don't know. We don't know what he's saying. But if you, for example, if you've read Ellie Wiesel and if you've read Night, we know that when he gets off the train, right away, one of these Jews kind of, they, they, they whisper to him, how old are you? And he says, I'm 14. And he goes, no, you're not. You're older. You're 17 or 18. And the same thing with his father. They say, how old are you? He says, I'm 50. He goes, no, you're not. You're 40. And in that moment, that Jew is not allowed to be doing that. But what is he doing in that moment? He's trying to save their lives. He's trying to help them so that they'll actually survive the selection. We know that it's not allowed. We don't know exactly what they're saying, but we can maybe think that he's trying to help a fellow Jew and risking his life to do that. Okay, now here um, we're going to exit the area and the track. We're going to, um, I just want to show you over here. You know, we're talking about um, the human story here. When we talk about all the Jews being killed, like the Jews killed in the shooting pits and the Jews that were killed in extermination camps um, and the 1 million Jews roughly that were killed in Auschwitz, when we come to the end of that, we have these shoes. Um, now, why do we have shoes to represent all the Jews that were murdered? Maybe we could have had eyeglasses, maybe we could have had sweaters or something else. But first of all, the shoes are very much, you can see the condition they're in. Right, we said the killing the Jews unfortunately is only half the story. The other half is how much they suffered all along the way, and the Jews and their and the shoes in their broken state really show us that. We're also talking about humanity, and it, it, we don't know who these Jews were, but you know what we can see here. Look at this. Here's a heel. Maybe what kind of a woman is wearing a heel like that? We can maybe give back a little humanity to the Jews that we don't know. We can imagine a woman of high society. We see her a work boot. Maybe we had a Jew who was a farmer and could always provide for his family, never had trouble, but it's taken away overnight um, by, you know, what happened. So um, maybe we can restore a little bit of humanity to the, to the people, the Jews that were killed by looking at the shoes. The other thing that I'd like to also point out is that when we talk about somebody's life experiences, what do we say? Don't judge them until you've right? Walked in their shoes. So very much uh, their footsteps. And so you've walked in their footsteps and the shoes very much represent, is, is a way that we talk about somebody's life experiences. And lastly, if we think about it, um, if we're visiting a friend and it gets very cold, we can borrow a sweatshirt or a coat or something like that. But borrowing somebody's shoes that they wear every day, aside from the hygiene aspect of that, is also very uncomfortable. And why is that? Because the shoes we know that we wear every day, they very much mold to our feet. Right? They very much, we get very comfortable in them, especially the ones we wear every day. Thereby, they become uncomfortable for somebody else to wear. So very much so, a shoe, unlike anything else, becomes an extension of the person themselves. So shoes really, to us, very much are very personal to the people, even though we don't know who they are. We come into this area over here. Um, we spent a lot of time talking about how the Jews were killed and how sometimes they reacted. Notice now we're gonna start walking upwards. We have some light here. We're gonna talk about a little bit how the Jews were saved and what happened towards the end of the war and the survivors. And so we're gonna come around here and you'll see that we have this area, if, oops, forgive me, um, where we do mention the people that we call the righteous among the nations. Those people, we see we have a whole room here dedicated to them, the people that were non-Jews that risked their lives to save Jews during the Holocaust. And the one thing I'm gonna say here is that certainly they represent um, resistance to us 100%. They tried to do a study to see what all of these different saviors had in common. And you know what they came up with? Absolutely nothing. 
absolutely nothing. The only thing they had in common, not social status, not what they did, not their religious level. They had nothing in common other than they viewed Jews as humans. Okay, so that's what we the takeaway here that we're gonna, I'm going to leave you with when it comes to the righteous among the nations. And we're going to go back to Auschwitz. But instead of talking about how the Jews were killed, we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about how they survived. And I apologize. I hope this is not making anybody too dizzy. But here you see it. I just want to show you. These women, upon their arrival in Auschwitz, and they're chosen to work. And just within a few hours, look what happens to them. Heads are shaved. You wouldn't even know they were women just from the neck up. Right, their clothes are gone. If their clothes are gone, like from Kluge, we know those last few items that were so precious to them were taken away from them. And in Auschwitz, their names, the last thing they have that they own to themselves, their names, we know those are taken away and they're given numbers. And those numbers, how are they given to them? They're tattooed. What else do we brand? Cattle, right? So we talk about the dehumanization of the Jews. We see it so clearly here. And I wanna show you this picture up here. If you see this picture, I'm going to zero in as much as I can. These, they didn't have uniforms anymore. So the women had to just grab the first item of clothing they saw. You can see they're all, none of them fit well. They're not wearing undergarments. You can see that too. And if you count one, two, three, four, see this woman over here? This is Lily Jacobs, the one who found the album. When this picture is taken, she's 18 years old when that picture is taken. And that's what the dehumanization process does to an 18 year old girl. I'm gonna call her that because that's very much what she is. Now, when we come to this area of the Jews surviving the camps, I'm gonna take you over here and I wanna show you something. Um, we have in this glass, in these, uh, behind these glass windows, we have a few items um, that tell us some stories. And the one I wanna share with you here, I hope you can see right in here, we have a ring. And if you can see, there's, there's the ring itself, and here's a picture. It's an H and a G engraved on the ring. And what's the story behind the ring? There was Greta first and Harry Knopf. Oh, here, you can see their names back there. Um, they found themselves working together in the offices of the SS in Auschwitz. This is in Auschwitz. They were, I, I believe both of them were fluent in German, and they were able to get those jobs. And what happens? They fall in love. They fall in love in Auschwitz and he makes her this ring. And unfortunately, um, when the death marches come, Harry doesn't survive and Greta does. And she looks and looks for him and she doesn't, and she doesn't find him. But I bring that to you because if we talk about the resilience of the Jews and we talk about the strength of spirit they show, even the ability to fall in love, we see even in the hell that is Auschwitz, the Jews are able to do that very much so, and that it's such a human, human emotion to want to be with someone and to be close to someone. So we see that even in Auschwitz. Now we're coming to the end here, and I'm jumping ahead to the area of where we have um, liberation for the Jews. And I want you to see though this picture here. You might be surprised. Look at what we have here. This big picture takes up, you can see the entire wall this is the feeling for liberation for the Jews. We might think it's a happy day, but we talk about the anguish of liberation for the Jews because for the Jews, for almost all of them, the day of liberation was the first time for years sometimes they didn't have to worry about where their next morsel of food would come from or if they'd survive another day. When they didn't have to worry about that, what did they have time to think about? Unfortunately, everyone and everything that they had lost. Right. So we tell people, people think that liberation for the Jews is the happy ending to the tragedy. Unfortunately, we, we, we try to tell people it really was just the final chapter of the tragedy. Or as one of our survivors himself told us, he said, it, there I had my second tragedy when I realized I was all alone. Now, with that, what do we have opposite of this picture? We have this picture. Now you can see here that very much looks like a religious ceremony. This is Rabbi Herschel Schachter. He grew to become a very prominent rabbi in America, um, but here he is just starting his career. He became a chaplain. He volunteered to be a chaplain in the American army. And he comes to Buchenwald. This takes place in Buchenwald, which is liberated by the American army. And he sees the Jews in the state they're in. And look at this little boy over here. You see him right there? That little boy grows 
up to become, he's known as Lulik at that time. He grows up to become the chief rabbi of Israel, Rabbi Israel Mayor Lau. And so the meeting of these two rabbis is really remarkable. He really rescues him from amongst a pile of corpses. But there's also something that, or another rabbi in this picture that I want to share with you. A lot of people don't know about him. A lot of people know about these rabbis, but there's another rabbi. He's 19 years old. He's not a rabbi yet. His name is Simcha Bunim Unsdorfer. And um, he was from Bratislava. He was the only one from his family to survive. He also winds up in, um, in Buchenwald. And he's about to go home with a friend. They're about to go home to see if anybody else survived. And he hears them announcing that they're having these services for a holiday that was to celebrate the Jews getting the Torah, getting the Bible in the desert, right? When Moses goes up. And um, it's just a few weeks after liberation. And he says to himself, when he hears the announcement, are, are they crazy? Really? They expect Jews, after what we went through, to go and to celebrate the giving of the Bible when we were just, we were just murdered and tortured endlessly because of that Bible? But what does he do? He goes, and it's so crowded, he can't even get in the room. He's not in the picture, he's outside the picture he can't get in. And he writes in his memoirs that when he sees the Jews, he calls them the cripples. He sees, he calls them the, the, on their last legs, he says, they go and they can reaffirm their faith in God just, and they can reaccept the Bible, just like the Jews did in the desert. He says he has this religious revival. Okay. So it's really, a, I, I think a beautiful story. And as we move in here, we have only a few more minutes left. So I went up end on time, but there's really a, a video. I, I really want you to see that, see this video if I can. We're moving, the war is over, and the Jews, it, it's many times dangerous for them to go home. 1,500 Jews roughly are killed in Poland by their Polish neighbors just for coming home. And so the Allies start setting up what we call the displaced persons camps, the DP camps. Uh, Israel's not a state yet, not until 1948. And then all these countries that wouldn't let Jews in before the war are still have um, um, barriers put up. And the Jews are stay in these camps, some of them from, for many years. But look what, I'm going to move over here and look up on the ceiling. I want to show you something. This we look up, this is a Jewish wedding canopy. Weddings become a huge phenomenon in the DP camps, in these displaced persons camps. Sometimes there are 10 weddings in one day. Okay, so we're gonna watch a short video um, about these, these weddings and we'll talk about why weddings, because um, many of the Jews, they just found themselves alone. And it, again, like we said, falling in love, we just, it's lonely to be the only person you know in the world. People, they just want to be with someone. Um, we have only a few minutes. So um, I think I'm gonna have to skip the video. I feel really, <laughs> I feel really bad. Um, so we're not gonna be able to watch it, but we really, we, we, we have a couple here and they, they describe meeting and they say, okay, you know what, we'll get married. And then they end up having a child. Now, of course, when we have so many weddings, 10 weddings in one day, what follows is the children. We have Bergen Belsen, for example, one of the DP, it was a concentration camp, but becomes a DP camp. In 1946, it had the highest birth rate in the world because there were so many babies being born. And of course, again, we have posters, posters that show the lives of the Jews. And you'll see here, Ort, they were trying to learn um, different um, um, uh, skills that they could do because they had so many of these young Jews had lost many years of schooling. You see also they were involved in sports. They're telling people, write down your story. But look what we have here. We talk about these babies. This is a poster of how to take care of your baby. And then I know we have, I'm going to move along as I'm talking. I know we have parenting classes today about how to get your baby to sleep through the night, you know, after six weeks. But that's not what we're talking about here. If you think about it, all of these new mothers, we have pretty much an entire generation of new mothers that don't have who? to show them how to be mothers. They don't have their own mothers. When we talk about these parenting classes. These are real parenting classes. They have nobody else to help them. They need help. Okay, and the last final gallery we have here in the museum, we call the Hall of Names. We're going back to the Memorial to the Names, Yad Vashem. We come in here, first of all, notice it's circular. We're talking about the cycle of life. So we talked about all this death, but the Jews go on, uh, even from that small remnant, uh, we see that they were able to build lives for themselves. What we have here are 600 pictures of Jews that were killed in the Holocaust. 
And you'll notice that behind the pictures, there are documents. The documents are all different languages. Those are what we call pages of testimony. A page of testimony is where somebody comes to Yad Vashem and they testify about a Jew that lived before the Holocaust and then didn't survive. And if they have information, they would give where they died or if they just know they didn't come back, um, they, they would say that. If they had a picture, they'd submit that as well. And then Yad Vashem would then have a record of this Jew that was killed in the Holocaust, right? Because Yad Vashem wants to collect his all the names if we can. Now, you'll see here surrounding this room, which is very interesting, are the binders that hold these pages of testimony. Fortunately, we do have empty shelves. We have today about six, uh, 4.8 million of the 6 million names. We'd love to get them all, but we know unfortunately that might be impossible because in some cases, entire families and entire communities were killed. Um, and I just wanna show you here in the middle, we have this, um, it, it, a hole that's dug into the ground. So first of all, a grave is dug into a ground. So it could be a symbolic grave for all the Jews that were killed in the Holocaust, but also there's water on the bottom and I really, you can't see into it, but I will tell you that when these pictures are reflected into the water on the bottom, the pictures themselves blur. And as visitors, you're my visitors today in the museum and you're standing here with me. We see the clear pictures on top. I'm telling you there's faded pictures below. We think about what happens with as time goes on with memory, memory fades. So who is in between? Like, where are we standing? Who is in between the clear pictures and the faded pictures below? We are. Today, the, you're my visitors in Yad Vashem. We're there. And I think Yad Vashem is sending us a message that we have a job. And our job is to make sure that this actually doesn't happen, that we keep in essence, this is a grave and it serves a purpose, but we want to keep, if the people couldn't live, we want to keep their memories alive because they deserve to be remembered. And we certainly don't want to help Hitler who wanted to not just kill the Jews, but erase all memory of them. So thank you all for helping us with our job here today. And we're going to exit the museum and end right now, hopefully more or less on time. Take a look back where we came from. When we first entered the museum, we saw what we called the living landscape, right? It was Jews living in Europe before the war. Unfortunately, now that we've moved through this whole story, um, almost all the Jews we know were killed, and certainly those communities don't exist anymore in any shape or form that they used to. We're going to turn around and exit the museum. We're going to walk out onto a patio. We're going to see Jews living in Israel. Notice it's open. We have so much light because our future is full of hope. Notice we're walking again on carpet because the Jews in Israel are home. And we exit the museum. Okay, and I'm going to show you the view that we have. One minute, you'll see that we are confronted not only with the Jews living in Israel, but we have this forest view greenery that represents to us rebirth and growth and hope. And that's how we end um, our tour here today, that we learned all these stories of how resilient the Jews were, whether they survived or whether they um, whether they were unfortunately killed in the Holocaust. We um, I, I hope we gain strength from their memory and that we use that um, as, as we go on in our lives and we hope to bring, only bring good into the world going forward. So with that, <laughs> we'll end the tour. I don't know if we have time for questions. You know, um, I, I unfortunately we, we don't. Um, okay, sorry. <laughs> just, uh, what an amazing tour. I just wanna thank you so I much. Uh, I, and I'm grateful that we had the, uh, the 90 minutes that we could fill in uh, every single minute of it. Uh, Cause what, um, a unique, a unique opportunity for us. Um, it's always a pleasure, Lori, working with you. Um, <laughs> for those who don't know me, my name is Dahlia Livin, and I'm co-chair with Marnie Bondar of the Holocaust uh, and Human Rights Department with Calgary Jewish Federation. And Lori, I just thank you. It's uh, you're so talented in how you uh, approach these tours. You're incredibly, uh, you're just so well informed and educated and. Uh, it's, it's such a unique partnership that we have with Yad Vashem that us in, uh, over here in Alberta, we can sit in uh, the warmth of our homes on a cold, snowy day <laughs> and how you take us through Yad Vashem uh, in Jerusalem. Well, you know, Dahlia, I told you, I don't stay up till 1230 at night just for <laughs> anyone. So that feeling is mutual. I feel, um, I, I really, I, I, I admire all the work you do for the, um, for the memory of um, the Holocaust and the survivors and the and victims, and really, you do you do wonderful work. And I'm 
just honored to be a part of that. So thank you for having me. And thank you everyone for joining today. Thank for you. sitting for an hour and a half. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much, Lori. And, uh, and I also, you know, this is on behalf of Calgary Jewish Federation and uh, the Ed Jewish Federation of Edmonton. We really just want to thank you, Lori. We also want to thank um, everybody at the Calgary Public Library and the Edmonton Public Library. Uh, again, it's, it's such an amazing partnership we have in bringing um, and enhancing Holocaust education to all of Albertans and uh, people across Canada. Today we have uh, people logging in all across the country as well as in the States. And so wow. um, we're just such a, we're so, so appreciative to everyone. Um, Lastly, just a, a few housekeeping items. Uh, we would be incredibly grateful to all participants if you could um, complete a survey. There's a QR code that will come up in the chat. Um, Marnie and I uh, and everyone uh, who works on these projects, on these programs, really appreciate your feedback. And, and uh, so we, we do take everything that you write in the surveys to heart and we reflect on it and, uh, you know, ideas that you, you know, things you're interested in, topics that you'd like to learn more on. We absolutely um, would love to hear your feedback. And I just want to thank our audience for joining us, uh, especially today on a long weekend. Um, you know, it, it actually struck me as we were watching this tour that uh, th this weekend is family day long weekend and what a what an experience to stop and just reflect on the importance of family after going going through that tour and the tragic loss and uh, it just the amazing um, the love that that people felt for each other and the loss and devotion um, and the spiritual resistance that you know I know I reflected on just how incredibly grateful I am for being free, having people in my life, being safe. And, and so um, I thank you, Lori, for, for really um, just taking us through the entire museum in just over 60 minutes. So um, also just to let our audience know, we have two more uh, uh, programs coming up in this series, this Holocaust series. Our next one will be on Tuesday, March 20th. Um, and it is, uh, it, it's titled All the Frequent Troubles of Our Days, the true story of the American woman at the heart of the German resistance to Hitler. Um, it's, well, it's also virtual, it's, on, it's a Zoom session starting at 7 p.m. Uh, and then again on April 24th at 11 a.m., we will hear Operation Finale, the capture and trial of Adolf Eichmann. I promise they are worth attending. They are uh, incredibly, uh, in, just interesting, interesting sessions. Um, and uh, we hope that you can join us for them as well. And again, there's no charge to, uh, to participate. Thank you everyone and um, just be well and happy family day. Take care. Thank you.